We've talked about civil resistance. We've talked about solidarity. It's time to bring them together and talk about how solidarity can motivate transnational civil resistance. And to do so, I'm going to be looking at transnational labor unions and the indigenous rights movement. Remember to like, subscribe, and share. The labor movement has always had a really strong international component. You know, think back to your Karl Marx, think back to your Frederick Engels. They said that the working man has no nation. And of course, the famous slogan, workers of the world unite. This was a principle that drove a lot of organization in the 19th century because working people didn't really feel like they were getting anything out of these national communities that David Miller likes to talk up so much. They were excluded from power. They were exploited at work. They were made to feel inferior and to tug the forelock at every gentleman who went by. But over the course of the 19th century, international organizations helped to build unity in the workers' movement through the first international, and then the second, and well, then nationalism raised its ugly head in the First World War and everything went to shit. But the lesson stands and was preserved in things like the International Labor Organization that workers across the world share something in common. When you are exploited in the same way, even if your experience of exploitation is different, you have a bond that can create solidarity, that can motivate change. In the global north, unions were incredibly effective at protecting workers' rights in the second half of the 20th century. When there was the old Fordist mode of production, workers' organizations, trade unions, managed to create a standard of living for working class people that was pretty much unprecedented in human history. You know, it's funny, pretty much for my entire conscious life, I remember people talking about the death of the working class with the factories closing, mines shutting down, those old, good, unionized jobs drifting away. But these jobs didn't disappear. They relocated. Multinational corporations have changed the nature of capitalist production. Instead of the centralized Fordist model of yesterday, we have a diverse and distributed production system, which spreads across the world. You know, think about the computer or the phone that you're watching this video on. Its various components are made all over the world. It's designed in, say, California. The raw materials come from Southern Africa. It's assembled in China. It's shipped back and repackaged in, say, Mexico. And then it winds up on your desk in the United States or in your hand in Germany. This is modern capitalism. There are a lot more people doing those traditional working class jobs. They're just spread out across the globe. When we talk about the working class, it's a, it's a tough thing to talk about because it's hard to say who exactly is working class and who is not. And whether there are sort of a labor aristocracy in the global north, you know, people who still have those high paying union jobs versus ununionized workers in the global south. And oftentimes we get this crude Leninist labor aristocracy model of the working class. But the fact of the matter is, is that workers' rights in the global north have been severely eroded over the past 30 years. We have seen the precariat, as it's called, become a major part of northern and southern economies. These are workers who are employed on fixed term or zero hour contracts. They're paid very little. They can't organize and they can be fired like that. It is a worldwide problem. It's not just in the global south. It also is creeping into the global north. Remember, capitalism in some ways races to the bottom. And we may have good jobs up in the north now, but they're going to be eroded slowly if people don't challenge these sources of exploitation and power. The type of solidarity that we often associate with the working class and trade unions fits into what uh, Emile Durkheim called uh, mechanical solidarity or mechanistic solidarity. You know, it's just sort of this automatic thing that arises from having a common identity and doing a common job. Now, I think this is probably a little bit too reductive when we're talking about the diversity of the modern labor force. Rather than talking about this mechanical solidarity, I like to think about it in the term that Richard Hyman uses, which is mutuality despite difference that we can have solidarity despite experiencing exploitation in different ways. Remember that Tommy Shelby idea of solidarity derived from oppression. We might experience oppression in different ways, but we have this 
mutual experience of oppression. And there is a lot of work by the transnational labor movement to create mutuality through worker exchanges, through talking about the different struggles that are happening perhaps in Sri Lanka, linking them to struggles that are happening in Peru, uh, linking them to struggles that are happening in the global north as well. When people see their life experience reflected in other people, when they say, your struggle and my struggle, they're the same thing, that creates a bond, that creates solidarity, that creates a thirst for change. Resistance to global poverty by the transnational labor movement is hopeful, but I'm not talking about a Marxist style revolution. I mean, if you know me, you know that I am not quite a libertarian, I'm not quite a Marxist, I have my own Republican beliefs, but I certainly have a sympathy to this idea that you can create solidarity from oppression because of course, plebeian focused republicanism has always said this sort of thing, even from the time of ancient Rome. And there's reasons to be hopeful when we look at the world today. There's some really interesting work done by Samantha Gunawardana on the attempts to create better working conditions in the global south. She works on an attempt by Oxfam and other INGOs to go in and help improve workers' rights. But what she discovered is that this top-down approach doesn't really have an ability to generate the solidarity that's necessary because this is sort of international experts, you know, it's like people showing up from the global north and telling people about their lives and how to organize them. It has a little soupçon of colonialism about it, and it doesn't really reflect the needs and demands of people on the ground. Now, what Gunmardana says is that when the workers are leading the charge and are supported by trades union and international labor organizations and international NGOs as secondary players, this is more successful because it helps to create ties of solidarity around the world that improve working conditions. Now, this is the sort of thing that can apply pressure. I know, I, I know I'm coming off as a bit of a bullshit in this, but the fact remains that when the workers unite, they can affect change. Individual workers are small parts of the machine. You can take one, get rid of it, and no one will say anything about it. But you can't get rid of all of them. Everything falls apart. When working class people unite, they can affect change. When they unite across the globe, they can create even bigger change. This is the power of trade unionism. And it is a form of civil resistance because although, you know, in the UK or in the United States, joining a union is not really civil resistance, is it, right? Because it's not illegal. You're not breaking the law. You're just doing something that you're totally allowed to do. Now, there's a whole lot of anti-union bullshit out there. Don't get me wrong. People get leaned on, people get fired, but people don't get disappeared in the global north when they try to organize. People get disappeared in the global south. People who try to organize labor unions often get murdered. We should be aware that this is a form of civil resistance, and it is a form of civil resistance that can be highly, highly effective. The second test case I wanna talk about is the indigenous rights movement. Uh, these are people who live in colonized states, in settler states, they're in the global south, and they're in the global north. I am Canadian, I come from one of these states, uh, we include basically every North American and South American state, uh, states in Australasia. Uh, these are places where people who are the original inhabitants have been dispossessed. They do not control the state, they have been marginalized, they've been pushed to the side. But this is also a site of resistance. I talked about this in the video on civil resistance. Indigenous activists run risks that people like me don't when they protest. Even in the global north, indigenous activists get murdered to say nothing of what happens in the global south. But they provide an excellent example of how different people can come together in the face of shared oppression. Now I'm gonna do something that you might not like. I'm gonna talk about slavery again. I know. I know. But it's a good example, everyone. Slavery is a really good example of oppression. And there are parallels between the indigenous rights movement and resistance to slavery. And I wanna talk about one that I haven't yet talked about, so it is gonna be new. I wanna talk about marinage. What is marinage? Well, you might have heard of the term maroon, right? These are people who leave and create their own isolated communities. Slaves often would run away from the plantations, 
but sometimes they wouldn't go up to British North America or the free states. They would stay in the South and they would start their own communities in places that were really hard to get to. The Great Dismal Swamp is an excellent example of this. They would create autonomous communities that would then raid into slave society. The same thing happened in Jamaica and many other places uh, where people would isolate themselves from the source of oppression and create their own communities. And you know what? This is a common theme in the history of slavery, not just in the States, not just in 19th century slavery, but if you go back and read the work of James C. Scott, he talks about how slaves and oppressed people often simply said, you know what? I'm out. I'd rather not be involved in civilization if this is civilization. And they would head literally to the hills. So what's the connection between Maranage and the indigenous rights movement? Well, a lot of the indigenous rights movement has decided to try to step out of the current global economic system and forge its own path. One of the seminal moments in contemporary indigenous rights was the Zapatista uprising in Mexico in the 1990s. Now this is an incident that blurs armed struggle with civil resistance because of course the uprising against the Mexican government was armed. But what's really interesting with the Zapatista example is how they effectively built transnational networks of solidarity through the effective use of the internet, which was one of the first times the internet was used to mobilize resistance in order to eventually push towards having an accord that granted autonomy to indigenous peoples. What's really interesting is how the language of the Zapatista movement changed over the insurrection. How it first started off as uh, sort of marxist e, talking about workers, talking about the proletariat, but transformed into the language of indigenous peoples, because this was actually something that produced solidarity in the community. There were a lot of people who identified with being indigenous and with the exploitation of a settler society. And this is what drew them in rather than the Marxist rhetoric. And it proved very effective at mobilizing communities across the world who experienced a deal of sympathy and solidarity, who saw their struggle reflected in the struggle of the Zapatistas. This wasn't an easy struggle. There were massacres committed by paramilitaries for the Mexican government, but the end state was the creation of an autonomous space for indigenous peoples that served as an example for other people struggling against the legacy of colonialism. This is a model for transnational civil resistance. It also bears parallels with Marinage, right? Because this is the no thanks, we don't want to participate. We're going to create our own area. We're going to create our own space where your rules don't apply to us. This might be a way of stepping outside the sources of global inequality and global poverty. Now, it might not be as wealth generating as global capitalism, but it does protect autonomy. And you know me, I love freedom from domination. However, we might not want to get carried away with this idea of civil resistance, either in the case of trades union or the indigenous rights movement. These are powerful movements and they can affect change, but we might say that the urgency of the issue doesn't lend itself to the gradualism inherent in trade unionism, or perhaps the isolationism that attaches to a lot of indigenous rights movement. We might say that the power of oppression of the oppressor will not tolerate free spaces. It will fight back against them and it will eventually use force. And this is where we might say, well, if we are facing violence from our oppressors, shouldn't we return like for like? Shouldn't we have armed resistance against global poverty and global inequality? That's going to be the subject of the next series of videos. Thanks for watching. Remember to like, subscribe and share. Take care, everyone. All the workers stop working, nothing happens. The economy falls apart. You know, they are many, we are few. Am I the capitalist? I was the capitalist the entire time.